Thanks for joining us today on Network Africa. I'm Jokia Rogers. As Peace Talk saying that ending Ethiopia's civil war continued for a second day in South Africa. Heavy fighting is reported to have taken place on several fronts in the northern Tigray region. A senior military commander with the Tigray forces said the clashes near the town of Adwa involved heavy artillery and tanks. Correspondents say the outcome of the fighting could determine who controls the two roads leading to the capital of Tigray. There have also been reports of clashes involving forces from neighboring Eritrea near the border with the Afar region. The Ethiopian military and its Eritrean allies recently took control of major towns in Tigray. Meanwhile, rights group Omnis International has called for a probe into abuses in the Ethiopia-Tigray conflict, saying every party involved in the war in northern Tigray has committed crimes against humanity. An Omnis International researcher for Ethiopia and Eritrea cited serious human rights violations that might amount to crimes against humanity and war crimes. Some of the human rights violations which they documented include rape and sexual violence, which is brutal and shocking. The first formal peace talks between the warring sides in the brutal two-year conflict in Ethiopia's Tigray region entered day three today in South Africa. Led by the African Union, the negotiations in Pretoria follow a surge in fierce fighting in recent weeks that has alarmed the international community and triggered fears for civilians caught in the crossfire. The talks are being held at South Africa's Foreign Affairs Ministry headquarters and will run until Sunday. 14 suspects accused of raping and sexually assaulting a group of women in South Africa in July have had those charges dropped. The National Prosecuting Authority reported today that DNA evidence taken from the suspects described as illegal minors failed to link them to the crime the suspects were arrested and charged after some of the victims pointed them out as the alleged rapists during the police identity parade. Eight women had been filming a music video on July the 30th near a disused mine outside Johannesburg when they and the film crew were attacked by a large group of men. Let's get more on this. We speak to our South Africa correspondent, Brian Pugeni. He joins us via Zoom from Johannesburg. You're welcome to Network Africa. Thank you for having me, Joke. Right, so tell us more about this, uh, this case so far. Well, this case started on the 30th of July, like you mentioned before. Um, um, there was a group of models and people filming a music video um, in one of um, the dam sites, one of the um, abandoned mines where a bunch of men just um, came out of nowhere and attacked them, robbed them, and apparently raped five of the eight models who were doing the music video. So police did a crackdown in the area. 80 suspects were arrested, um, mostly illegal miners who are called Zama Zamas here in South Africa. And they, they were identified some of them were identified in a in a parade and but the 14 who identified today we found out that the dna which was taken is not um linked to any of them so we saw the police minister coming up before saying um they are very confident that the 14 people's dna will be identified police minister came out saying that um the dna is indeed um uh, from the 14 suspects were identified so right now at the moment um it's like we're back to square to square one um none of the suspects are, are, are more now the only charge that they have is that of um contravening the eva so that's the latest coming out from that case um, so are there any leads to the real criminals in the matter We seem to have lost contact with Brian. We'll get back to him as soon as we can. Uh, let's move on to other stories. A China media group, CMG, has held a seminar titled China and the World Embarking on a New Journey in Johannesburg with representatives from the South African government and academia sharing insights on China-South Africa cooperation. 
with the theme of new opportunities for Africa's development from China's future planning. The seminar examined new cooperation opportunities between China and South Africa, China and Africa. Attendees congratulated the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China on its successful conclusion and expresses hopes that China would play a greater role in further deepening cooperation between China and Africa in various fields after the Congress. We need internationalism and international solidarity from China more than ever before. President Xi made it quite clear, regardless of your glorious past as a party, any party must constantly reform itself. Constant reform. And therefore, CPC demonstrates to us time and time again that is in the business of constant reforms. In Burkina Faso, the military leader Ibrahim Traore has assured U.S. diplomats that he will not recruit Russian mercenaries to fight Islamist militants in the country. This is according to a senior U.S. official who has just returned from West Africa. Western nations have condemned neighboring Mali for deploying Russian mercenaries to battle jihadist groups in the country. They accuse Russia of providing material support in the development of mercenaries from a Wagner group, although Kremlin denies any involvement with the sh uh, shadowy private military company. UN Humanitarian Affairs Chief and Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffith says the world of Burkina is a world of opportunity as well as a world of tragedy. He believes that there's an opportunity to work closely with the new authorities to build confidence and trust so that the population of Burkina Faso can now can some sort of international support. In a press conference in New York, Martin Griffiths briefed reporters about his visit to Burkina Faso last week where he met the new leadership and got a better understanding of the humanitarian situation in the country. I wanted to just say to you that the world of Burkina is a world of opportunity as, a, as well as a world of tragedy. That there is an opportunity, I believe, we believe, our colleagues in the field work closely with the new authorities to make sure that we have the relationship with them of confidence and trust so that we can do our job and so that the population of this, this country, which is, uh, whose predicament has got so much worse this year, can at least have some sort of international support. We uh, have helped 740,000 people access health care, food aid to 1.8 million, nutritional support to almost half a million children and expecting mothers. What has happened in the last year in Burkina is a huge increase in, our, in incidents of violence. Uh, no doubt this is part of the reason for the fact that we've had two coups there within a year. Um, the latest is, is a couple of days, days ago, I mean a couple of weeks ago. We have a 800 million response plan for this year. We're now in October, getting on to the end of October. We are one third funded, so we have about 300 million dollars again, largely the generosity of the, the United States and the European Union. And of course, we need more. And this is a story we're seeing all over the world. To be one third funded this year is very, very normal. Security guards shot and wounded a man dressed in military attire outside the Russian embassy in Harare on Wednesday night. According to police spokesperson, Paul Nyati, the 24-year-old man had confronted security guards at the embassy. He was taken to a local hospital where he remained under arrest as police conduct an investigation into the incident. The Russian embassy press attache Igor Kroptothink says that the surveillance footage shows a man staggering towards the guards. As he approached the perimeter of the embassy, an officer fired what could have been a warning shot, but the man continued to move towards the security. A second shot was fired and the man collapsed. He did not appear to have been trying to scale the wall.
Let's now return to our conversation on uh, the rape situation in South Africa and the suspects uh, that were uh, freed by the courts. Uh, Brian Pagani is back with us. Uh, Brian, I was asking you if there are any leads to the real rapists since uh, the men that were accused have been let go. Well, the... Actually, they haven't been let go. They are still in custody because they're now being charged um, with contravening the Immigration Act, which means they are here in the country illegally. So they are still in custody and they'll be back in court on the 1st of November um, uh, pending a further investigation. So at the moment, there are no new suspects. Um, so we'll be waiting to see on the 1st of November what the National Prosecuting Authority will say when these suspects appear again in court. And maybe from the 80 other suspects who are arrested, they might link the DNA to the, to the suspects who are involved in the rape case. Right. So what's the atmosphere like in South Africa? Outrage. I, I mean, I don't even have the words. Um, well, like I said earlier on, people are not happy because the police minister did come out um, during the investigation when the DNAs were being taken to say they are really confident that the 14 other ones were involved in the sexual assault of the eight women who were, who were raped. So at the moment, people are now are not happy saying, how can the police minister and the police come out to say they are 100% they are sure that these are the suspects? Because now we're literally back on to square one or zero to say we don't have any suspects. So we are going to have an uproar from different groups and even the, the suspects, the victims themselves are, 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 will be hurt by, by, by this news. So at the moment, people are not happy in the country. Um, um, analysts or everyone in the country are not um, really excited about what just happened today. Right. So, I mean, you said there are no other clear leads uh, to this case. So what's the police doing to ensure that uh, the victims get justice? Well, what the National Prosecuting um, Authority is saying is that they are, the, pen, the investigation is still pending. So what we are thinking is that they might... Um, from the other suspects who were arrested. Uh, like I said, there were 80 suspects, but then they'd taken the 14. So maybe from the 80, they will try and link the DNAs to, to any of those um, 80 suspects at the moment. But at the moment, we really don't know what the investigation will, where the investigation will take us um, until we hear from them um, on the 1st of November to give us a clear direction to say, do they have any new suspects or what leads do they have um, going forward? Right, thank you so much for that. Update, so our South Africa correspondent, Brian Pogani. The president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, has met his Guinea-Bissau counterpart and chairman of the Economic Community of West African States, Umaru Mbalo, on Wednesday in Kiev. Mr. Mbalo said that he visited Russia the day before and talked to Vladimir Putin, who thinks that direct dialogue between the two countries that's Ukraine and Russia, which are sisters, could be very important and desirable. Moscow, which has the world's largest nuclear stockpile, has launched waves of conventional missile and drone strikes targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure since October the 10th. Kyiv says they've damaged up to 40% of the nation's power system. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has ruled out talking to President Vladimir Putin after Russia proclaimed the annexation of four Ukrainian regions last month and rained missiles on Ukrainian cities this week in the wake of an attack on a vital bridge between Russia and the annexed Crimea. The President of the Democratic Republic of Congo will serve as a facilitator for the political transition process in Chad. And that's according to the Economic Community of Central African States, which held an emergency summit in Kinshasa to discuss the situation in Chad. It comes after around 50 people were killed in protest against military leader Mohamed Idris Deby last week. Speaking during the summit, uh, she says, Keddy said that uh, it, he was thankful for the honor of being entrusted with the facilitation mission. Chad has been in political turmoil since the April 2021 battlefield death of longtime leader Idris Deby, after which his son, Mohammed, seized power. Opposition parties and civil society groups have been calling for protests to demand a quicker return to democracy. 
and then we go back to South Africa, where the national emergency, or rather, here in Nigeria, the National Emergency Management Agency has commenced the airlift of relief materials to River State and Bielsa State, both in the south-south of Nigeria, affected by the ongoing flooding disasters in parts of the country. The operations from the Edo Nema office in Benin City will transport non-food aid. NEMA is collaborating with the Air Force because major roads in the affected states are becoming inaccessible. Uh, the reason why we are lifting is because uh, there is no access road down to these uh, states and uh, hence the need for also collaborate with Nigerian Air Force to uh, lift this relief material. We are starting today with uh, the lifting of non-food items and tomorrow we will continue with uh, the food items. An Air Force plane waiting on the tarmac of the Bini Airport to airlift relief materials to rivers and Bielsa states for distribution to those affected by the flood disaster. Operations from the Edo State Office of NEMA commenced on Tuesday to lift non-food relief materials with support from the Air Force as roads in the affected states are inaccessible. An aerial view of communities affected by flooding shows the extent of the damage and the amount of work that needs to be done. On the ground, it's a beehive of activities at the Port Hackett International Airport. First to land are helicopters. Then comes the heavy-duty C-130 cargo plane, bringing in NEMA's much-needed supplies from Benin City, the Edo State capital. These are immediately transferred to other transport aircraft, and the fully loaded choppers take off for Ibogane Bayelsa on one of multiple daily flights between both states. So far, we have, over, we have lifted over 3,000 bags of rice, we are currently lifting about 1,200 bags of uh, beans and uh, other uh, relief supplies. Overall, the, the effort of the Nigerian Air Force is part of the military aid to civil authorities in times of crisis like this that the Nigerian Air Force is mandated to undertake as part of their constitutional uh, duties. At the Bogan Air Airstrip, the materials are formally handed over to the Bielsa State emergency management agency before they are offloaded. Then the team proceeds to the Oxbow Lake IDP camp for inspection. We are very, very grateful to NEMA for this good gesture. Though these things are coming quite late, we've been suffering for some time. You are all aware of the Bayasa situation. Secondly, we are grateful to the Nigerian Air Force, the chief of air staff. I can recall 2018, flawed. The Air Force came with a great medical team here, yeah, right in a book in a year. Help and cured several of our persons who were affected by the flood. Once more, we are grateful to the Nigerian Air Force for this good way of humanitarian gesture. The stark reality of the situation is explained by the camp controller who paints a grim picture of the condition she and other internally displaced persons face. Never should help us because there is post-flood crisis. This is just a, the flood season. After the flood, people will move back to their various homes. We need things that we can use able to fumigate places, our various homes. Any effort will go a very long way. The Miracle Governor, he has tried with all the agency in charge coordinating this place. They have given us a very good food and medical treatment. They are taking care of us. They gave us foam, they gave us net, and they are helping us so much. The Nigerian Air Force Base in Genegua, the capital of Bielsa State, is also completely taken over by flood. Officers and men have to walk through water to attend to their daily security duties. To boost their morale, the Chief of Air Staff comes visiting with some relief materials for distribution to officers and members of the host community. 
from house to house that distribute the relief items to residents. All what I have to say is thank you to God and the authority that have done this. God will continue to bless the authority and us that is living around you. Aside gifting the officers with relief materials to cushion the devastating effect of the flood, Air Marshal Ola Dayuamo embarked on a tour of the Nigerian Air Force Base in Yanagua. It's a sorry sight. It's uh, really unfortunate. Uh, it's, um, it's not the making of any uh, man being, but nature. You see, you know, what I will always want to find is a uh, cause. And of course, we in the military, we take it as if we are in the war front and we address it as such. The most important thing is to provide succor for the people that are affected. The Nigerian Air Force says the airlift operations will continue in the coming days and the hope is that this will help ameliorate the sufferings of those displaced by the flood. Elsewhere, the number of confirmed Ebola cases in Uganda has risen to 109 and the outbreak has claimed 30 lives. Uganda's Health Minister Jane Ruth Acheng said this, adding that the government was setting up an additional treatment centre. Fifteen of the confirmed cases were among health workers, of whom six had died. The Ugandan Health Ministry had, has also confirmed that six children from one family have tested positive for Ebola virus in Kampala. They are part of a family of seven who took in a relative who had travelled from Kasanda, one of the most affected districts, and later died in the capital. One of the children currently in isolation is meant to sit his final primary school exams on November the 8th. Acheng said five treatment centers were operational and a sixth was being set up. The virus circulating in Uganda is the Sudan strain of Ebola for which there is no proven vaccine, unlike the more common Zaire strain seen during recent outbreaks in uh, neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. There is no known treatment for Sudan Ebola virus. Currently, there are a number of promising treatment options that the Ministry of Health is using under trial, including monoclonal antibodies and repurposed drugs like remdesivir donated by the U.S. government. However, the doses available are still very few. So far, 13 patients have received these trial drugs with relatively good outcomes. The Ministry of Health will be evaluating the efficacy of three candidate Ebola Sudan vaccines on contacts in the coming weeks. The candidate vaccines are Oxford from the United Kingdom, Sabine from the United States of America, and Mark from the United States of America. The main objective is to evaluate their efficacy to protect primary contacts of Ebola patients within 29 days of contact. We plan to vaccinate contacts of 150 confirmed cases. This means about 3,000 initially. The trial preparation has been concluded and we estimate that we may begin the trial in two weeks' time. Kenya's new 22-member cabinet is set to be sworn in today, a day after they were approved by Parliament. President William Ruto has retained one minister from his predecessor's cabinet as an advisor on national security and introduced the position of a prime cabinet secretary. Former head of the central bank, Unju Guna Ndungu, will be the new Treasury Secretary, while former Parliament Speaker Justin Muturi will be the new Attorney General. The President rewarded his political allies with Cabinet appointments, despite promising that the Cabinet will be gender-balanced. Mr. Ruto nominated only seven women to the 22 ministerial positions, with two women as presidential advisers and one Cabinet Secretary. That's Network Africa. Thank you for watching. I'm Jocker Rogers.